So get this. You know how yesterday we heard from the book of Hebrews, or the letter to the Hebrews, and today we also hear from the letter to the Hebrews. I took a little peek into the future and see that we will actually be hearing from the letter to the Hebrews on and off, more on than off, for the rest of this month of January. And that's only as far as my devotional went that I was looking at. So we could be going into February too. I didn't take the time to go look any further. So strap in, we're going to hear a lot about the letter to the Hebrews. And before you start thinking, oh boy, now it's going to get boring. We're going to hear about the same thing every day. It's going to be boring and I'm going to get pretty tired of this. The letter to the Hebrews has a lot to offer us for our theology. It has a lot of our Christian identity wrapped up in it. It's where we we have a lot of these themes that we take as Catholics to be central to our belief. The theme especially of what Jesus' sacrifice on the cross meant for us and how we can participate in it as well. So I thought I'd give a little bit of background on the book of Hebrews before we start. So it's it's usually said um, introduced as a letter to the Hebrews. And it's not really a letter. If we look closely at it, it's more of a homily. It's written in this exhortative style. You can tell that it was probably given orally. We just say the letter to the Hebrews because that kind of tradition has, has uh, said that before. And it was attributed to Paul at first, but it really isn't Paul's writing at all. It's really an anonymous letter. We don't know who wrote it. Um, but we see that this letter has different themes, or this homily has different themes throughout. And the themes are kind of circular. They're not in a linear format, but they're rather circular. They keep coming back. And that gives more credence to the idea that it probably is a homily. So we see a lot of these themes throughout. And today we see the theme of the Old Testament being the prefigurement of what happens in the New Testament. The author of this homily really likes to look at the book of Psalms. So he sees these types or these figures in the Old Testament as being fulfilled in Jesus, as being the per- Jesus being the per- perfect fulfillment of these, of these types, of these forms of the Old Testament. So we see it today. He uses Psalm 8, although he doesn't seem to know that it's Psalm 8 because he says, somebody has testified somewhere. So it, it sounded like he was just really excited to go and he couldn't even look it up. But um, he says, someone has tested some, testified somewhere What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him little less than the angels for a little while, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. So the original idea here was to be about humankind, humankind being little less than the angels, that God had given man, had given human beings this dominion over the earth. We hear that in Genesis. He gives Adam and Eve dominion over the creatures of the earth. And he says, fill the earth, subdue it, all of that. So we are given dominion over things. But then the author of this letter, of this homily, also recognizes that mankind really is not in control of the earth as we would think, as this would suggest. We've not been given that dominion in the way that it might suggest that we have been. It's really that we can see that's true because we have a worldwide pandemic that we are having a difficult time trying to keep under control. We have natural disasters, we have famines, all kinds of things that are bad that that human beings are not in control of. And we have a hard time understanding that even. We have a hard time accepting that. But what he does say is that we see Jesus. It's the first time that he mentions Jesus's name in this letter in the second chapter. And he says, we see Jesus who is crowned with glory and honor. So now he switches from humankind, but saying that Jesus is the one who was crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death for our salvation. He said, it is fitting that the, our leader to salvation should be made perfect through suffering. How are you made perfect through suffering? Well, he's saying that Jesus, because he suffered, is the per- it, and that gives us our salvation. And his suffering, because he offered all of that out of love, it means something for us that we are too, we can be made perfect through suffering. So when we can offer our own sufferings, our pains, our weaknesses, those things that weigh us down in life, when we don't pit, have a pity party for ourselves, but rather we say, Lord, I'm gonna offer this with your sacrifice, with what you've given, 
we are perfected like Jesus is perfected. Isn't that amazing? So today, let's do that. Whatever it is on your mind, whatever it is that is pulling on your heart, those things that are causing you suffering, pain, anxiety, offer it with Jesus. Offer it with Jesus who is per perfect through his suffering so that we too might become perfect through our obedience to him, through our offering our sufferings with him, that we may one day live in heaven with him. God bless you.